Greetings. My name is Haley Tauber, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with you today as a part of the Yale Center for British Arts Reframed series. And today I'll be talking about the practice of plein air painting um, through the lenses of John Constable and Winslow Homer's artistic practices. To introduce myself, I am a first year student in Grace Hopper College and a student guide at the Yale Center for British Art and very fascinated with plein air painting. Um, so before I get into the tour, I thought I'd give some background information about Constable and Homer, who are the two painters that I'm going to be primarily focusing on during this video. So first off, um, I'm going to give a brief overview of John Constable and then Winslow Homer, and then going in to compare and contrast some of their paintings, for example, some quintessential paintings um, of the outdoors that each artist did. Um, and I'll be talking about differences in their technique and the subject matter that they chose to capture and maybe their emotional states while they're creating the artwork. Um, and then discussions of how they depicted the sea and each artist's fascination of how the sea reflects human emotion. Um, so yeah, so going into the overviews, um, John Constable was an English landscape painter in the Romantic tradition who lived from 1776 to 1837. Constable pioneered an artistic practice called plein air painting, the subject of this tour. Plein air is essentially the act of painting outside, um, and it can take many forms, such as an oil paint or watercolor, at various stages of the painting process. For example, Constable often created plein air oil painting sketches, which were unfinished works meant to help him plan larger paintings. So he would make these sketches outdoors and then go back into the studio to complete these polished works that we often see in museums as opposed to the sketches. He's also really famous for his series of plein air cloud studies um, in particular that show the dynamic nature of a changing sky. Um, and he showed a deep fondness for pastoral England and used plein air paintings to spend time outside in the natural landscapes he loved, which I think is really beautiful. His paintings are an ode to pastoral England and experiment with different techniques to render the natural environment. Yale Center for British Art is fortunate to have a large portion of Constable's work. Um, and in particular, I was interested in his paintings because they reminded me of the work of my favorite American artist, Winslow Homer. So Winslow Homer was an American painter who worked primarily in the oil on canvas and watercolor on paper mediums. He lived from 1836 to 1910, and he was actually greatly influenced by Constable's work which is why I'm comparing them side by side. Um, and we can definitely see that within his work. In fact, Winslow Homer first came to London in 1871 to visit paintings by John Constable and Joseph Turner. His artwork was also heavily influenced by the French Barbizon School. And the ideal taught at this school was to appreciate nature for its own sake through a romantic style in landscape paintings. The name Barbizon comes from the village next to the beautiful Fontainebleau forest. Many British painters were influenced by the Barbizon school, such as the English romantic painter Richard Parks Bonington, with his painting in 1925 called In the Forest at Fontainebleau, um, which is part of the Yale Center for British Arts collection. Bonington's layering of light-toned blues and creamy white shades to paint the towering stones suggests that even the harshest aspects of the natural landscape can be held gently in the viewer's eye. I find myself drawn to the ideology of the Barbizon painters because they capture nature scenes in an intimate sense, with as much impartiality and simultaneously with this deep dedication to showcasing the environment in this most natural, raw form as possible. Um, and we can see that in this painting, especially with how the trees are rendered, you know, gently blowing in the wind and this really fragile detail um, of the rocks and how they're not so different from the sky in terms of the tone used, which I find rare in artwork where you have like these gentle blues that are fairly consistent um, and make the sky feel as soft as these clouds, um, even though we know in reality it's not. 
So next I'm going to be discussing two works, um, one by John Constable first, and then the next by Winslow Homer, that I think are really quintessential plein air works. Um, and they're somewhat of an ode to the outdoors, um, showcasing this love of plein air painting and how it allows artists to interact with the natural environment in a really exciting, engaging way. So first, we'll be discussing John Constable's painting, Cloud Study Early Morning, Looking East from Hampstead, um, which depicts a sunny morning in England. And although it's a fairly simple scene, there's a lot going on in terms of the brush strokes that Constable used, and it's quite dynamic in nature. It's especially captivating when the viewer is reminded that it is a plein air work, simply meant to act as a study as opposed to this polished painting that's going to be you know, put in a really ornate frame and hung proudly on the wall. Instead, it's meant to help the artist reference what that morning looked like, how the movement felt in the clouds, the wind, the trees, and the kind of light, you know, gauzy blue shade that we have all across the painting as a neutralizing tone. Um, there's somewhat of a rough quality also, which is very interesting in such a peaceful scene, two constables brush strokes here. Um, we can feel his touch in the painting in a really strong way. And in some of these detail photos, we can see that the clouds have somewhat of a buildup of paint when there's these, you know, orange and cream highlights that he, you can see him kind of like haphazardly almost quickly putting in. Um, because you'd complete a lot of plein air works quite quickly because the scene changes. Um, so they're meant to capture movement instead of this like super ultra realistic depiction of the scene. Um, additionally, we have these trees that are rendered with very little detail that I love. If we go back to the overarching, you know, big scene, we see that they're very, you know, maybe from afar they look like trees, but then up close, they're just dots and little little squiggles um, that Constable did in green to render this, you know, these little patches of trees across the landscape. Um, and that's pretty trademark of plein air because you're trying to figure out how to render the landscape in as few movements as possible because it's this really speedy process. Um, and he's practicing a lot of efficiency um, in this painting, even though it's a simple scene, it's showcasing a lot of the plein air technique from these little dots that become trees when they're put into the context of the scene to these really rushed, you know, diagonal brush strokes across the sky, rendering the movement of clouds in the morning. Um, and forces the viewer to work when they actually see plein air studies. Constable's making you say, what is this brush stroke meant to represent? It's not, it's easily given to you as maybe a more detailed painting, we kind of have to do work and put ourselves in the shoes of the painter and say, what, what is this that I'm looking at? What time of day could it be? Um, it forces you to ask a lot of questions and leaves those questions unanswered as opposed to maybe a more stylized, like highly detailed finished work, um, which is really beautiful because it's forcing the viewer to engage with this work in a new way, even though it is the artist somewhat private, you know, private sketch of what was happening then. So next I'm going to discuss Artist Sketching in the White Mountains, which is a painting of Homer's that I really love. Um, and both of the paintings that I'm discussing from Winslow Homer are from the Portland Museum of Art, um, which is close to my hometown in Maine and has a really amazing collection of Homer's works, which is one of the reasons why I fell in love with his paintings. So Winslow Homer painted artist sketching in the White Mountains in 1868, and he depicts the act of plein air painting in a communal environment, which is quite rare for Homer because he was a really solitary artist. An anecdote that I really love involving his level of solitude is when he moved to Prout's Neck in Maine, um, which is a beautiful, beautiful location to live, especially as an artist. Um, and Maine's definitely already notorious, I can say, is a place where writers and artists are known to seek solitude for, you know, creating these kind of dramatic works, perhaps. Um, but Prout's Neck is especially isolated in certain ways because we have, you know, this really, some of violent waves crashing against the rocks um, along, along the coast. Um, 
And Homer allegedly put a sign on his home studio on Proud's neck that read, snakes, snakes, danger, keep out. Um, and it really truly doesn't get any more main than that. But, but how this relates to artists sketching in the White Mountains, apart from being kind of an amusing anecdote, is that Homer is really showing a fondness for this community of artists that's involved in plein air painting. Um, and he shows a more social side to the occupation as an artist. And it's very true that plein air painting can bring together artists. It can be this really solitary practice, um, especially when you're just in the studio to be creating art. But there are a lot of ways which artists have worked communally. One example now is Monhegan Island in Maine draws so many artists each summer to paint. And it creates this really amazing, you know, community of shared knowledge about plein air work. And in, you know, New Hampshire, the White Mountains used to be a really big place of community and might still be. Um, but the, in this painting, we see three painters in New Hampshire's White Mountains at work. Uh, and this painting is really unique because Homer's also showing, apart from the communal aspect of plein air, but the act of creating a plein air painting and everything that goes into it. Um, it's a part of the larger body of work called White Mountain Art, which was meant to attract people to move to the region. Um, and a lot of artists were drawn to the White Mountains for its untamed wilderness, which they thought was really beautiful, but also makes painting a lot more difficult. Um, for example, even though they look like they're peacefully painting now, think about how much work it would take to bring just one of those umbrellas and easels and, you know, bag of paints up on a mountain to paint. It takes a lot of work and you could be hiking miles up pretty steep terrain, um, which is not easy. And it adds this athletic element to plein air painting that I find especially captivating. Um, you know, it it's very interesting. We see like the sun hitting the top of you know, these umbrellas that are used to block the sun so the artists get like an even, you know, even shadows and they don't come back to their home and see that, you know, the painting has light that's all off. Um, and these easels that help add an angle um, and the artists are sitting in chairs because it is exhausting because they're out there for hours, you know, hats that block the sun from them getting sunburnt. Um, and then all of the paints that they have to lug up you know, the mountain that they're painting on. So it's very unique. There's not many paintings that showcase this act of creation, you know, in such a such an intimate way as artists sketching in the White Mountains does. Um, and then a fun little detail that I do enjoy that I think is very playful of Homer is you can sort of see his name or at least H-O-M on this painter's bag, which suggests his presence in this community. Um, and almost at least feels to me like he's very fond of, you know, the people, at least in the community that he's depicting in the White Mountains and is like, I'm a part of this beautiful thing too, which is really lovely. So next I'm going to be talking about some tempestuous tides that John Constable and Winslow Homer enjoyed depicting and each of their really unique relationships with the sea, um, which is a subject of a lot of their paintings um, for the both of them. And in plein air painting is an especially difficult sort of topic to cover because each artist approaches it in such a different way and the tides are always changing and moving and sea is very difficult to paint, um, which I'll cover when we're talking about first, um, first Constable's work, Stormy Sea Brighton. Um, which he painted it on oil, in oil, on paper laid on canvas in front of a storm approaching the shore during a stay with his family in Brighton in 1828. Um, and he had to work really quickly to create this piece, which we can see in these brush strokes that are really hurried and, you know, kind of like swiping along the canvas with this white or cream color to create the froth and, you know, these points that feel very violent in the clouds. Um, and he's depicting an incoming storm before rain and harsh wind would make painting impossible. 
So this is an incredibly ambitious work to create. It's one thing to paint the sea when it's placid and, you know, you kind of have these calm waves rolling in and it can be a leisurely process. But when there's a storm threatening to knock your easel over, you know, destroy the painting and oil and water do not mix so rain as well as a threat, that's that's like a difficult, difficult subject to sort of capture, which makes this painting really exciting because it shows Constable's attempts to paint the sea during, right before a storm. Um, and the speed with which he had to work can really be seen when we look at some details, such as the ocean's froth, where you have this buildup of white paint. Um, and yeah, these just really like either horizontal or kind of like, splotchy marks that he's making which we can see um to create the sea foam effect which i think is really effective especially when you stand back and be up close looks a little bit more vague and is forcing the reader to do that work um the rushed quality also makes the upper portion of the sky somewhat muddy we can see these neutralizing tones that are kind of in like a salmon or reddish color um and purple, which I find to be more trademark of Constable's work, where it's a little bit muted. Um, you don't really have... It, the violence is captured more in, like, realistic tones um, that are drawn out, and it's not quite as vibrant, except for when we have these points of, like, really bright blue in the sky and water um, in, in the background. Um, but the neutralizing tones help kind of smooth everything out um, when... Constable's working in plein air, um, which is this sort of, yeah, salmon pink color. Um, and especially when an artist is working with a lot of speed, it's important to have a unified palette, um, which we do see here. We have white, blue, maybe, you know, some mixture that's like a purple color, that neutralizing salmon tone, and then a little bit of yellow ochre in the bottom right corner. Um, so it's a fairly limited palette, which I think helps it be a more cohesive piece, especially when the artist is rushing to get it done before this storm threatens to destroy the painting setup. Um, the painting also has a really dark atmosphere overall. Um, and another reason for that, other than the storm, um, is a more personal, you know, personal subject to Constable because his wife Maria was really sick when he created this painting. The family visited Brighton in hopes that her ill health would improve, but it unfortunately worsened over the course of the trip. And four months after Constable painted this work, Maria succumbed to tuberculosis. So contrasted with his earlier work, such as the previously discussed painting, the cloud study early morning looking east from Hampstead, this plein air painting explores moody weather and Constable's sorrowful, emotional state, um, which again is something very interesting in plein air painting where it's the artist's emotions joining with the actual state of the weather that maybe is drawing that out and both kind of merge to create this really emotionally impactful, you know, natural scene, even though it is just depicting nature there's a lot more to it through the color choice and the way that the artist is creating you know the brush stroke movements and building up this texture and all of the feeling that comes into that should not be discounted to just oh it's another you know seascape it's it's not just another seascape it's a moment and it is you know it captures a feeling that constable was having of deep sorrow and you know maybe losing a bit of hope for his wife which which is really powerful. Um, and next, um, discussing Weatherbeaten, which is, I think, my favorite oil painting. Um, so Winslow Homer's Weatherbeaten was painted in 1894 and again is from the Portland Museum of Arts collection and is so beautiful in person. And it's a pretty large work and it's just really impactful, impactful up close. Um, it's especially dear to me because it depicts the rocky shore of Prout's Neck where his studio and home were situated, um, which is a spot that I really enjoy walking along. And it's a great place to go and think and walk and just enjoy being out in nature. Um, and it feels very unique to me and with these sharp waves against the dark rock, you know, you can't really call it a beach that he's depicting, but I, I think I do because, you know, rocks ocean even though it has a violent feel to it it is 
it's not your sandy beach, but I I feel very, very fondly towards it. Um, so one major difference here between the sea and the skyscapes of Homer and Constable are the warm toned colors that they're using to neutralize blue. Before I talked about Constable's use of that kind of salmon pink in the sky to neutralize the blue tones and kind of help it become more even and cohesive. Um, and here, um, Homer opts for yellow ochre sometimes, but here we see this really like intense red, reddish orange tone um, in the rocks that is really beautiful. And then a very vivid blue. Um, so we have a neutralizing red tone that's a little bit deeper instead of that sort of subtle salmon pink, which I think gives this painting some of its, you know, its power and feeling of, you know, violence that the sea can have. So Constable also often uses cream, as we can see, um, in the ocean's throth, or, you know, a white tone that's not quite as bright as the one that Homer opts for, um, which really acts in sharp contrast with the really, really dark rock. Um, and, but again, we see this limited palette here that we have blue, red, you know, a bit of purple in the sky, and then this really, really bright white for the seas foam. Um, and it has a lot of cool undertones within the sea and then warm undertones in the rock, um, which again, it makes for a really cohesive, sort of, there's a tension there, but it also encapsulates a lot of different tones that maybe are, aren't realistic to the sea in different moments, um, but a cooler quality overall because the sea has, you know, those cooler bright white undertones in the froth. Um, so the theme of nature in terms of its relationship to man is less personally emotional for Constable or Homer than Constable, um, who tied in some of the darkness in his paintings later in his career to the loss of his wife, um, whereas Homer never married and instead spent a lot of time, you know, along the shore. Um, and he did have a creative obsession that was maybe less personally related, um, but he was obsessed with the sea. In particular, Homer was fascinated by the perils involving seafaring life. He saw the ocean as a simultaneous source of life and death and an extension of all perils involved in being human, which is really engaging. Um, and his fascination with the sea began when he painted at Color Coats, a community in Tyne and Ware near Newcastle on the North Sea, where there's an intense fishing community. Um, and during his time there, 19 whole months instead of the six months he planned to spend there, Homer observed the Life Brigade, which is essentially a group of fishermen who would save people on ships from extremely perilous situations and risk their own lives. Homer acted as an observer of these brigades and thus was curious about how the fates of humans and seafaring communities were intertwined with the sea and he produced numerous watercolors and drawings but few paintings from his time there. This extended to the subject matter of his plein air painting in paintings in Maine such as Weatherbeaten where we see a lot of the perils maybe without the human presence but he's forcing us as an observer to put ourselves in the perilous situation of being on the on the shore where a storm is approaching and we have these waves crashing and there's these dark rocks um, and we are forced to confront some of our own, you know, humanity in the sense that we are fragile and the sea is not. Um, he was very preoccupied with the sea's violence um, and he acts as an unjudging observer though in this painting, even though he's depicting that violence, um, it's in a very beautiful way. Um, which kind of adopts the Barbizon attitude of acknowledging the natural environment without putting your own opinion on it. Um, and weather Bean also signifies a shift from Homer's fascination with genre scenes to natural forces. Although there are no figures in the painting, again, the viewer cannot feel, you know, cannot help but feel as if Homer has imposed us on the rocks where we're threatened by the sea spray and the dark blanket of foreboding clouds that are rolling in. In some, John, oh, and here are more details. <laughs> in some, John Constable's artwork had a significant impact on Winslow Homer's plein air painting practice. Although the artists were fascinated with slightly different topics and developed different color palettes, they contributed to a rich history of plein air painting through similar approaches to the artistic practice. 
For example, both artists share in their tendency to incorporate humans into landscapes but not allow them to attract attention to images such as the clouds or sea, you know, where the human's acting as an observer but not, you know, maybe a major player in the landscape. Additionally, the concern for the natural environment was portrayed through sympathetic depiction of untamed lands. They also have an inclination to generally use palettes of, you know, gray, dark blue, cream, and occasionally a pop of red or the salmon, you know, that constantly uses. And they both use a sense of movement um, in the skies through these brushstrokes that maybe are diagonal or, you know, quite dramatic um, that they create um, and a fascination with the ways in which clouds flow across the canvas. Most of all, the relationship between their depictions of the environment reinforces that the plein air oil painting traditions in Maine are, ir are influenced by British art history irreversibly, and it's a part of, you know, the heritage of Maine artwork um, in, in plein air painting, and that's why I was really fascinated with this topic, because I hope to engage more with plein air painting, um, as it's a rich part of, you know, my state's history and is very influenced by Constable's work and British plein air painters. So thank you so much for listening to my presentation today. Um, I really enjoyed speaking on this topic um, and hoped that you learned something about plein air painting. So thank you very much. <laughs>